I know you're laughing, and that's the whole point. I want you to laugh at this because it is kind of funny, but it's actually very serious. So welcome to the last lecture of E. Ama. Um, the, um, the last lecture is, is designed to summarize things uh, in a nice way, uh, put you on the right track for the future in case you want to continue in this area or in case you're looking for a good summary um, resume of, of the entire uh, course and, and probably the, the level of macroeconomic knowledge that a master student should have in, in our program. Um, today I'd like to review uh, last week again, um, move to um, the new Keynesian model, uh, describe that leap in different, different dimensions because we've, 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 uh, we always cut corners in, in this field. Uh, we're looking for representative uh, decision makers, representative agents, and then we want to evaluate how well this is done. Um, I'm going to sh suggest that there are critiques of this. I'm going to suggest um, other approaches that we won't talk about in this course, that uh, improvements on what we've done. Uh, I'm going to do a two-by-two two table, which is always useful for those of you who um, like that kind of thing. It's a good way of organizing your thoughts. Uh, do, do not to Paul Romer, but to David Romer, um, a macroeconomist who is um, on the West Coast, um, as I understand it, um, he's at Berkeley. Um, then this is going to give rise to what I call the ISTRPC model. So it's IS from ISLM. Some of you come from that training, and some of you have heard of the TR, the Taylor Rule. Um, and then we have the Phillips curve. So this is a way of kind of unifying a lot of different strands, and it is nothing but a sort of a, a, an implementation of the new Keynesian uh, approach in a way that you could get your hands on, maybe even use a computer to simulate. And if you work for a central bank, you could work with much more fancy, larger, uh, much larger models. I'm going to mention a few open questions in macro that bother us still and suggest there are new areas of research. And then I would like to just do an overall review. Okay, so last lecture, we talked about Rodenberg briefly. Uh, I gave you more details on Calvo. So these are the two paradigms for dealing with price rigidities in, a, in the next generation of micro, semi-founded, semi-grounded uh, models. The Calvo model, as you saw with Andreas, is, uh, is, can be quite detailed. I gave you the easy version. Um, and I showed you how you could, you could motivate, um, you could use that to motivate uh, the, the, the principles of the Calvo model, the idea that not all firms are changing prices at any point in time, but when they do, they're going to set it with a, with a view to the fact that they can't or won't change the price in the future for a while, so it'll be a steady price. And that may be seen as a limitation of Calvo because it, it induces firms to try to, try to front load um, their decisions into the present because they know that if they don't change the price properly now, accounting for their expectations of the future, they may make a, a big mistake, which will hurt profits in the future. Um, and the, the more detailed model um, is, will be sketched in the section in the problem set. The idea is to actually have firms maximizing uh, using this price parameter. It will lead to a first order condition or a set of first order conditions that look just like what we did yesterday, last week, and we'll review again today. The key lesson is that there's an interaction between nominal rigidities on the one hand, the firm not wanting to change or not being able to change prices in terms of the monetary unit, and the justification for doing so. So even if prices are, are flexible, the firm may not have a whole lot of reason to, to change the price uh, because there's some, there's some costs involved or maybe there's not much profit to be gained because, of, because of, uh, the, the profit function is very flat around where the firm wants to be. Those were things we talked about last time. And I brought up some, some critiques which are still valid to be heard more intensely in different circles, uh, depending on where you go to graduate school and where you uh, work. But uh, there are things we have to take seriously. And I, I proposed, you know, I, I tried to inform you on some new advances in this area, which have come around in the past 10, 15 years, the idea of thinking of information as being sticky instead of the price being sticky. This has some advantages. Uh, it leads to more rich, to richer dynamics on the on the the, the way inflation evolves over time in response to a shock. Uh, one of the facts that we seem to have is that inflation is persistent. 
And another fact is that when the central bank lowers interest rates, it takes a while for that to show up in inflation. It takes, um, depending on the, the time, it actually may take, take more or less, may take more time. Uh, recent evidence, especially when the central bank can't reduce interest rates, is that monetary policy is pretty, pretty uh, impotent. Um, so let's go to that critique and go into a bit more detail. The, um, again, this is something that would be a great exam question, just sort of sketch the reasons that uh, in the, uh, the new Keynesian model, which is pretty clever, it's uh, quite tractable, it's re resulted in a lot of research, it's still kind of limited. So the, the problem is that the price level uh, and inflation is still too flexible, even though you have these, these rigidities, you have um, especially in the, the Calvo approach, you, you basically have firms, um, when they get the chance, they really go for it, and it leads to, um, to some issues that uh, we, we saw already. I'll try to, I'll try to review this again. Uh, and again, if you're interested in, the, in another presentation of this idea, uh, please take a look at Robert's, which is on the, on the website, on the, on the Google, uh, the, the Moodle. <laughs> website. Okay, so the assumption, the primary assumption is that firms are not allowed to change prices anytime they want. So we, we saw in the monopolistic competition um, set up in the diagram last week and the week before last that firms actually like, uh, would like to change prices and uh, really maximize profits in every period, but there are things holding it back. Okay, so in the Calvo approach, the first order conditions of a, of a rigorous model would lead to this idea that if a firm could choose its price, it would be an average of its future optimal prices. And that was given by this kind of geometric forward-looking sum of the, the firm's anticipation given time t of future optimal prices. So instead of setting its periodic uh, optimal price, it kind of knows that it won't be able to necessarily do that every period, so it's going to take an average. This turns out to be a very fair characterization of the first order conditions in a complicated model. So this I'm kind of doing you a favor because I want to show you the, the logic uh, the idea of this recursive um, approach to modeling the price in the Calvo model is, is robust. It gives this kind of weighted average. So you take the price I will, will set today, and it's a weighted average of what I would set today if I didn't care about the future binding uh, Calvo constraint, if you like. Uh, and then this other weighted average of the future stuff that I would like to do, and I can just rewrite that as the, an average of, of the the price I would really like to change, plus an expectation of what I would choose if I were in the same position I am today. Okay, so I've rewritten this, and it's, it's recursive, because you see it's an expectation of the PT plus one, given information in T. So this, this is what macroeconomics is all about. It's about recursion. Recursion, we're looking to the future, we see ourselves in the future taking the same decision, but conditioned on different information, and thus leading possibly to a different outcome Okay, but I can still use that knowledge today. Okay, so think of that as the, this rigidity-free price. It's still in there. It's this optimal price I could choose in the absence of any constraints at all. And basically, it's an, this rigid price that I'm going to choose today in, in a Calvo setup will be a weighted average of my free-to-choose price plus uh, an expectation of what I would do if I could do it again tomorrow. Okay? Now, taking this uh, under... Advisement, at the same time, the firm cho cha charges its old price if it can't change, means that you've got this, you've got an index of the actual price level today. It's a mixture of those firms that actually do get to change today and those that are still stuck in the Calvo limbo, state of limbo, not being able to change the price. So you have a similar type of backward looking uh, moving average of, of the price today. Uh, that you'd like to set, or you will set if you're allowed to set, with probability one minus phi, and then with probability phi, you're sort of stuck in um, in the state of um, of what you did before. So combining these th two things together gives us this really nice representation of the inflation rate, um, and we went to this in detail last time. But the inflation rate is simply because this is these price levels are in logarithms. The first difference of the logarithm is an approximation to the inflation rate. Okay, that's the first step. And the second step is just the, the, the final um, expression we derive. Um, and it consists of three parts. One is the expectation of the inflation rate tomorrow. Okay, and that's the outcome of all these different firms, okay, and aggregating them in the Calvo, uh, with this Calvo uh, 
principle allows us to make this really nice geometric average of prices, okay, because it's an arithmetic average of the logs. The second term is that you think of this as the, is the, the tension of aggregate output or aggregate demand coming through marginal costs. So beta is positive, phi is, lies between zero and one, so we have this, um, this thing that looks like the slope of the aggregate supply curve. Right, so we had this idea that firms can change uh, prices costlessly or without any Calvo impediment with uh, phi very, very close to zero, then this slope, the slope of this aggregate supply would be very, very, would be very high. Okay? And, and beta is capturing, as before, this, this uh, underlying willingness to change the real price given uh, the freedom to do so. And the last term is the supply shock. So the expectation of epsilon is zero. But in period T, you've seen epsilon, it's right in your face, so you'll do something about it. Okay, so think of that as an oil price shock today. Firms uh, that are allowed to change will do so, and that's why you have this weighting factor before it. Okay, so even if, if you have a, a Calvo reality, there's an oil price shock of 50%, some firms will not be able to change their prices in period T. Okay, the others will do so. Okay. This is the Calvo version of the New Keynesian Phillips curve. Okay, and this is the one that I think most courses in advanced uh, um, settings in most places around the world would teach in a, in a PhD course or an advanced ma master's course. So the, and again, there are two different ways. I showed you two weeks ago, you can use the Rodenberg principle to get the same answer. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a robust idea. And we're gonna kind of, we're gonna look at this very carefully. So take that curve and lead it by one period. Just lead it by one period and you end up getting, literally adding uh, one period to the entire set of t's to get t plus one. So pi t plus one would be, a, would be three parts. It would be an expectation conditioned on t plus one information of inflation in pi in t, uh, pi in t plus two, plus a second term that depends on aggregate demand in the same fashion, but again, re related to y t plus one, next period's uh, level of output relative to trend. And the last thing is the, the last term is the, uh, the supply shock in T plus one. Okay, now insert that result in the original curve. The original curve had the expectation in T plus one. So it's, it's a little bit tricky because you're gonna have an expectation of an expectation, right? So you take the first equation here, insert it into the second, and you get um, this. Okay, so we know how to do that. We know that expectations operate as linear. Okay, and it's conditioned on period T. We also know from the law of iterated expectations that an expectation of an expectation conditioned on a future time period uh, under rational expectations would give you the expectation in period T. Okay, so voila. Um, apply that law and also apply the fact that the expectation in period T of, of epsilon T plus one uh, is gonna be zero. We can eliminate that term immediately and we can rewrite um, the result as follows. Okay, so inflation today is an expectation conditioned on today's information of inflation in period T plus two, plus the expectation of the demand uh, tomorrow as well as the demand today. And demand today, I know, I'm observing it. I'm a, comp I'm a firm observing it and the price shock today. So you can actually do that a number of times. You can do it as many times as you like. You can push this T plus T into the, into the future, T plus uh, cap T, okay? And you get something like this. So you can see that inflation today is really kind of a weighted average of expected future states of demand plus some tail of the dog in the future. And if you have discounting like we had in the problem set, um, that leading term disappears. It'll be pre-multiplied by a a discount factor, and as t goes to infinity, that disappears. So the first term will disappear, and you get something like this. And this is the kind of um, implication of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. The, the current inflation is an expectation of the, 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 the cost push or the, the margin uh, tension on the price level in future periods as well as today. Okay, so the, in some sense, the, the inflation rate is kind of a, is a loose cannon. It, to the extent that inflation does have a, this forward-looking aspect, those firms that have chosen to change their prices will definitely, will definitely do so. so. So inflation in equilibrium, again, this is an equilibrium condition in the Calvo model, has this, this inter interesting implication. So as long as aggregate demand is expected to be uh, 
kind of low, then inflation will be low. But if as soon as firms expect rationally for uh, the economy to go into a boom phase, you'd expect uh, inflation to jump very quickly. So this is a problem for the Calvo model because we don't see that in the data. The inflation rate that we observe in Germany and the United States has a backward-looking dependence as well as a forward-looking dependence. There's no doubt about it that there's an inflation expectations component, which is important. If firms expect higher inflation, it will have an effect on pricing today. But we, we also have this other, um, this backward-looking component. So getting that into the model uh, is a problem. I put this slide in just to remind you where this is coming from. So the problem set that we'll address, we'll finish up uh, this week, is basically embodying all these micro foundations with this Calvo trick. It's not quite micro founded, but we have a nice equilibrium concept. It looks like a model that's consistent, but you still have this limitation of lacking inflation persistence. Okay, so inflation is too flexible, and the answer is really easy. Those firms that can change actually do the heavy lifting for the entire economy. So they're really kind of, they know that they're going to be stuck in the future with a high probability, so they go for the inflation today. And that's a problem for us. It's not a problem for the economy. The economy obviously has its own behavior and we just observe it. But our model has a problem. So if you're, you know, if you're a good economist, you look at the model and say, well, it's kind of a problem. Let's go back to our drawing board and write down another model and see if we can do better. Okay, that's what I tried to motivate last time. Okay, this goes back to, this is a 20 year old idea. The Calvo model is 30 years old and we still use it uh, with various degrees of intensity. Uh, but this paper is one of the most important papers I think that kind of pointed out that uh, something is missing in terms of the US data and actually in, other, in foreign countries it's the same. Okay, so this, this problematic prediction is actually worse than you think because it means that if you anticipate a future policy. Suppose you get a new uh, chairman of the, of the Fed or a president of the European Central Bank that announces, a, says, I'm going to fight inflation like a dog, uh, and you better get ready, and I'm, I'm going to credibly do this. This should, in the Calvo model, have an immediate effect on inflation, even though nothing has happened to the real economy. In fact, it would cause a boom in most models. So this is a real problem because we know in most countries when you fight inflation, unemployment goes up, output falls. Okay, there's an inertia in the price level and the inflation rate. It seems to mean that uh, the past inflation is like this. It's like the, the symptom of a terrible disease and you, you just gotta, you don't have to sit it out. It's like having a terrible flu. It's gonna take two weeks for you to get, get rid of it. Okay, that's one, um, one way of thinking about it. So this puzzling implication that an economic expansion should follow a credible uh, announcement of disinflation is, is not supported by the data. And also you have this Cap McCallum critique that I mentioned last time, which said that the, the, the regime of, of, of announcing and continuously deflating over time should not permanently allow a country to have more output, which is another implication of this, of this uh, puzzling uh, thing. So one of the reactions of our profession is to have different ways of doing this. Okay, so one, you know, the one cheap solution I think uh, you mentioned or you mentioned, somebody actually got it, was to have uh, indexing. So we think that firms actually, some firms are kind of lazy or they're too busy. So instead of having, even if the Calvo Ferry comes, um, you know, they're, they're, they may not be uh, mobilized to do so, but we'll just say that if the, the Calvo Ferry comes, they still do the right thing, but if they don't, if the Calvo Ferry doesn't come, the firm just marks up its price according to what everybody else is doing. Okay, so this is called indexing. This is a really cheap solution, but it works. The problem is it really works so well that people just assume it. So if you're working for the Bundesbank and you're going to you know, try to plug a, a decent representation of German inflation, this is probably a, a good, cheap way of getting it to, to work. But it's subject to the Lucas critique. It's exactly the critique we had before about um, you know, not thinking about how people form expectations. And, and unless, you have the, unless you have the micro foundations of why indexing is a good idea, maybe you should try something else. I already, we tried something else. We tried the Nazis idea, Mancu Ries, um, the assumption of sticky information. So actually what's going on is not that the firms are able to change prices with some randomness, but it's actually firms change their price plan with some randomness. Okay, and the Benassi, Benassi uh, version is actually more general, in my opinion, than Mancu Reese because it actually allows prices to change over time. So you can actually have a price plan. Okay, 
um, a, sim a simple single price will also give it to you. And Mankiw and Reese in their paper show this quite uh, impressively. I showed you the, the slides last time. Okay, there's even more sophisticated ways. So uh, Robert Lucas, whose name you know, and uh, uh, Golosov um, have written a paper. There are many other ways to do this. You basically assume that the, the state is what matters for the price decision and not the time or the time since your last adjustment. And um, this type of model makes a lot of sense because we observe in the data a lot of firms that just don't change prices. They just don't do it. So it's not like they're indexing every period. They're just basically not changing. And maybe it's because of menu costs or they're, again, going back to Rodenberg, the problem with uh, uh, causing aggressiveness in your customers if you, if you change prices too often uh, and, the, and the like. Um, the state-dependent model seems to have a good chance of capturing uh, this, this total inertia, not changing prices at all at the micro, micro level. And if things get really, really serious, if inflation just sort of rises to 5%, then everybody kind of wakes up and uh, changes prices. Okay, so that's a, this, uh, this is a nice paper that um, I was brought to whose attention. I was brought um, recently by Kostein and Nakov that actually does this in a, in a parameterized way. So they actually capture Calvo as a special case and move to a state-dependent model as the other case. So this is just literature at the end of the, of the you know, there's a lot of other new areas uh, we'll talk about in a second. So again, I've, we've got a good idea of what's going on now in macro in terms of this really important fact that prices don't change. In, the, in terms of the monetary unit, we want to understand how that affects uh, the behavior of the economy in the aggregate. We have two good stories. We have the Rodenberg story. We have the Calvo story. And they both lead to, to a new Keynesian Phillips curve that says that you know, expected future inflation is important in the aggregate price level, and the present and future marginal costs, uh, or if you like, the margin um, uh, that firms choose to, to price over uh, the, the costs that they um, incur when they produce the output. So this is kind of the, so now we want to move, move to the aggregate setting and try to figure out where this, this takes us. Uh, we need to finish to complete the model. We're not done yet. Obviously, we have to to add um, aggregate demand. We have to figure out what is driving why um, uh, from the demand side, because the the New Keynesian model actually has why as a as in fact it's a, it's a supply factor. It's causing firms to raise prices because of their cost situation. So to close the model, we need a demand side. We need the AD curve. Okay, and, the, and the, the, the cheap way of doing this is to go back to what we've done in our class and just pull out the components that make sense. Okay, so I'm going to try to do that for you. The most important thing we know that in, in the modern economy that we have today in, in, in Europe, in the United States, Canada, Japan, the money supply is not controlled by the central bank. Okay, what the central bank controls are interest rates. And interest rates are the opportunity cost of lending for the banking sector, and the banking sector provides the money, in effect. Okay, so the, the nominal interest rate policy of the central bank is going to be what we'd like to model. Um, and again, this is again holding everything else constant. So the, the, the nice thing is we've moved, very, we've, we've moved a long way since I went to graduate school. Okay, so we actually think really hard about the central bank, the way the central bank behaves, and it's because of John Taylor's work on thinking about monetary policy in a systematic way, like a rule. And it, I'll show you in a second, um, this is a pretty good approximation. Central banks like to fight inflation around some target, and the target may be different in Turkey than it is in Italy uh, before the Euro as it is in the European Central Bank after the, the Euro was, was founded, or the United States. So. You, we have an anchor, which is the central bank's objective, but, th but around that objective, the central bank will raise interest rates whenever inflation rises or its expectation of inflation rises. And we'll also care to some degree about, about whether the economy is in, in, in a good state or a bad state relative to its productive trend. Okay, so that's the Taylor rule, the Taylor principle embodied in a simple equation. In the background, we've kind of gotten rid of cash. Okay, so we haven't, we haven't gotten rid of cash like... Um, my friend Hans van Azin claims the ECB wants to do. It just it doesn't matter. Okay, in an economy where the, the Fed, where the central bank sets interest rates and there's some rigidity, some, some, some 
some stickiness in the economy, the money supply will be demanded, um, and it's, it's basically a demand-driven demand for money, just like the demand curve we had before, but we don't care about it because there's no feedback. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice gift uh, that Taylor gave to us, which may, allows us to basically ignore money for at whatever cost. Maybe in the future we'll, we'll find that to be a huge mistake. Um, we also have a problem with the, the zero lower bound, so interest rates can't go below zero at the, at the, um, the level of borrowing. I mean, banks aren't going to uh, force people to pay interest for, for the money they borrow. Uh, aren't, are not going to pay customers for the interest that they, but they borrow, then customers will just um, hoard cash. So the, it's kind of an interesting um, problem. Um, but, you know, if you look at the most countries around the world are moving away from the zero lower bound, especially the United States. I think this is a transient, a transient problem. Okay, so how do we do this? We go to the Taylor Rule, we look at it. Uh, recall that we've, we've stated this many times, it's, it's a way of thinking about central, it's a way of, of capturing a rule, a policy rule, and um, using that, implanting that in a, in a demand uh, equation, equation for the demand for goods and services, and you have a demand curve. That will be our trick. I'll show you this in a second. So Taylor said the interest rate policy of the central bank and therefore the policy of uh, the short run interest rate um, showing up in interest rates in money markets is simply a function of three things. It's a function of a target or a neutral interest rate, nominal. Remember, nominal interest rates are in terms of the monetary unit, not the real interest rate. Okay, so if you go into the real interest rate, you have to subtract some expectation of inflation. The second part is the is the policy part that reacts to a deviation of inflation from its trend. And this is presumed to be a linear relationship for the sake of the argument. So A is positive, um, and B is the response of monetary policy, the interest rate, to the output gap. The output gap is simply the, the level of, of GDP relative to its trend normalized by the trend. So it's a, it's a, it looks like little y in our model because the little y was the log of output around its trend. So that's equal to zero when you're at trend and positive when you're above, negative when you're below. Okay, so this is not an iron rule. Central banks seldom agree uh, with the statement that they do this, but this is what the data seem to suggest. Okay, and there are aberrations, but I'm going to show you some pictures that might impress you. Okay, the idea is simply uh, this is a way of characterizing the behavior of central banks, so we don't have to ask them. And maybe sometimes central bankers will get up in a bad mood and raise interest rates, or there'll be some crisis in the money market, which holding everything else constant leads to a change in interest rates. But if the central bank um, has anything to say about it, it's going to follow this rule. Okay, that's the Taylor the Taylor uh, rule, stylized fact just like the, the Caldor facts in growth. Okay, so if you take this literally, money supply, we don't care about it, just ignore it. It's there, in booms it's gonna be growing fast because people need the liquidity. Uh, in recessions they'll be paying off their loans and deleveraging de, uh, de and banks won't be lending much. Okay, so the, you know, who cares? So if you look at the data, this is, a, this is from my book with Charles Whiplow, this is a incredible, this is, this is not econometrics at all. We just took two parameters, plugged it in, and just tracked the interest rates. And if you do a serious job with econometrics, you know, you can use um, really fancy techniques, you get a much better fit than this. There seems to be pretty good evidence that, that banks uh, do this, central banks actually do this, even, even if they deny it. Okay, so we're going to take that Taylor rule and plant it, implant it into... Um, something we're already familiar with, the Euler equation, the Euler equation, for, and we'll come back to that in a second. And then we'll have basically an AD curve. So AD is equal to IS, and that's called the, that's the intertemporal decision for the economy to consume and invest today versus tomorrow, plus TR. Okay, so it's just <laughs> the, the AD curve that we showed before is simply the outcome of that. I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a second in detail. Now, um, I want to make a little excursion because this is the last class and I want to make you aware there are, other, there are other views of the world that are also kind of interesting. I should tell you that Karl Marx, who actually taught at this university many, many, many moons ago, actually thought that money was completely irrelevant. Karl Marx thought 
that the, the business cycle was a real phenomenon, and it was because of struggle between capital and labor, falling rate of profit, etc. He had lots of theories that are not quite uh, um, the big theories today, but uh, the idea was that he thought that the monetary thing was just a sideshow. Okay? So, you know, I think we have to be honest. There are a lot of people from various, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to convince a, uh, someone who just observed the financial crisis, the monetary sector is irrelevant. But um, you might say that the, the actual money supply and the evolution of interest rates were kind of secondary. What really happened was the, the intermediation uh, between banks and uh, the real economy broke down. So still in all, we should mention a class of models that, that basically um, have fig features that Keynes talked about in the general theory, but still have market clearing. Okay, so these are, price, these are models in which prices are flexible, and yet you still have something like Keynes described in the general theory. He said animal spirits are important. So Keynes was pushing this idea that, you know, even if things are fine in the monetary sphere, even if consumers are doing what they want and uh, no one's suffering, if firms suddenly have a de complete depressed view of the future, this could actually affect the, econ the economic equilibrium going forward. Okay, so Keynes talked about animal spirits. Animal spirits were things, basically just gut feelings. Uh, it's a great word, animal spirits. Uh, it's, a, it's a very sort of ma macho, masculine thing, but it's, it's kind of this idea that people, you know, they go to have a drink with their, with their business buddies and they say, you know, the, 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 the market looks great today. It looks fantastic. I'm gonna go buy a, I'm gonna buy a new machine for my, for my factory. And the other guy says, hey, it sounds pretty good. If he's gonna do it, uh, he must know something I don't know. So uh, they go to their rotary clubs and they tell, <laughs> they tell their friends and suddenly you have this, this self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, that's, capturing that in a model is not easy because models that we play with have unique equilibria and they usually have unique paths to the equilibrium. Okay, that's the, the, the Blanchard Kahn condition was kind of a, an expression of that idea. Okay, but there are a lot of people out there uh, who believe that animal spirits are kind of a separate driving factor for the cycle. So I wanted to make you familiar with that, with this little excursion, this, this, this uh, um, little diversion I'm gonna take you through. And I'm gonna talk about sunspots. I'm gonna talk about things that are completely exogenous to the economy, and they're actually irrelevant. But for some reason, people fixate on them, and then something happens. Okay, and I don't know if you know what a sunspot is. Sun flares, solar flares, the sun every, with amazing periodicity explodes in beautiful uh, solar activity and creates lots of energy. And a lot of that energy comes here and makes us uh, apparently act funny, like animals act funny when the solar flares are acting up. And I guess humans are animals, so we must be actually, uh, I know I'm in a bad mood when the solar flares come. Um, so, uh, you, I know you're laughing, and that's the whole point. I want you to laugh at this because it is kind of funny, but it's actually very serious. So, so it's a competitor to the to the models that we've p pushed up up to now. We've had a real business cycle model. We've had a, uh, a new Keynesian version that central banks use. But if you go back to, to Reed Jevons, our friend who was a monetary economist, he also thought they were kind of important. And I think we should at least have in our mind that these things could matter. Okay, so... And again, the, the deep idea is that, that psychology can matter. And humans are psychological animals, and basically they see things happen, and then uh, you know, maybe a, a rational approach would say, well, they, maybe they don't understand, and they're using learning. They see their, you know, it's like, a, like a, when, when, I, when I ride my bike uh, home, and uh, this is so cool. All of a sudden, yeah, I hear this grunt, and then I see eight Wildschweine, wild boars, run across the, the path. Now, why are they doing that, right? Why are they doing that? I'm on a, I'm a bike, I'm on a bike, I'm not threatening them. And on the other side, they're grazing and burrowing for, for, for roots. And all of a sudden, the master schwein, you know, the, <laughs> the master boar starts grunting, and then they come across this path. And they're not threatening me, but they're all going in the same direction. So it's, a, it's clearly herding behavior, grounded in some evolutionarily advantageous feature of their existence, that when they do this, it actually helps them survive. Now, why they ran across me in the path, and I had to stop and let these eight guys, uh, and, and girls, whatever, and then these little babies kind of running across, it's terrifying, right? 
Um, the point is, uh, people have this behavior all the time. Look at, look at financial markets. And you know, you can say it's rational. Maybe it's because the Wirtschaftsschweine have have a have a Bayesian Bayesian learning, and they figured out that if Bert is coming with a bicycle, they better get out of the way. Uh, or um, in any case, this is um, this is fascinating. We should not ignore this possibility because it expands our ability to explain uh, the cycle. Okay. And there are a class, there's a class of models that actually can accommodate this. So these are markets where market, these are models where markets are clearing at all times, and yet they still have this Keynesian feature that investment surges and drop declines can actually cause a cycle on its own. Okay, so we, we again, I want to spend 10 minutes discussing this because I think it's important. So here's a picture of sunspots um, and um, this is a, an Australian guy, I think, that did this. Um, you know, it, the, the dark curve is basically the is sunspot activity on a, on a monthly average basis. Um, and there's a predicted curve that you really can't see. It's kind of, it's uh, just a smooth moving average. And then these, these shaded areas are the recession years, uh, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. So you see there's something there. Um, not clear what it is. It's can't be everything. No one, no one in their right mind would say that's the only cause of, um, of cyclical downturns, but it's, you know, um, why not? We should take it seriously. The cool thing about this is that it's exogenous. There's no way human activity can influence the sunspots. At least, if you want to tell me about it, come after class and explain it to me. But um, this is pretty exogenous from our perspective. It's much more exogenous than money and banking and, and uh, technology. Technology is also kind of endogenous, right? Technology could also respond to the cycle um, or respond to incentives. So let me spend a few seconds finishing up this idea before we go on uh, back to the new Keynesian model. So Keynes um, stressed um, you know, nominal rigidities, the idea of, of, of rigid nominal prices, rigid nominal wages is actually uh, pretty much in his his, and this is why he's such an important person for us. He actually, he he actually uh, made this a theme of his book and showed the co the consequences without using a whole lot of math. I mean, he was basically uh, showing that if, especially wages, if nominal wages don't go down because you don't want to be the first one to cut wages, if you know your friend's not cutting his wages, and uh, if you're a firm, you don't cut prices because you know they're not cutting prices, and you're just going to get a lot of, you're going to lose profits. Um, he, but he was also concerned about uh, the notion, which was a feature of the Great Depression, especially in the United States, it was impossible to reduce interest rates. They were at the, the zero lower bound. It was impossible. Uh, so the idea was that maybe even if they could reduce uh, interest rates, it wouldn't be enough um, to drive interest investment back to its previous level. Okay, so he spoke of animal spirits. Professor Summers at Harvard has, has made this a continuous theme. Okay, he thinks that... Um, the in opportunities for investment, productive investment in the OECD um, sphere has, has fallen to a, to, to a low point. Even if the Fed could cut interest rates, uh, it wouldn't be enough to, to you have to make it negative. Okay, so the, the only way you can make interest rates negative is to have inflation, uh, to make real interest rates so negative that the firms just, you know, are just going to lap up the, the credit to, um, to invest in real uh, assets. Okay, but forget all that stuff. Just think about um, think about the notion of, of uh, animal spirits as being a possible, um, you know, possible augmenting feature, and maybe these expectations uh, are even rational uh, taken in the context of the model. But you know, maybe maybe they're just uh, random, extraneous, external. Uh, sources of, of, uh, of disturbance in the economy and not really something that we would think about as economic. So think about a, a new president being elected or um, a wave of pessimism, political pessimism. Uh, it could be the sunspots, something outside the model that actually focuses the economy on an equilibrium. So that's what the, the sunspot equilibrium uh, literature does. Until now, we've considered models that have a unique path to the equilibrium. Okay, so in the, in the, in the uh, we talk about a policy variable, and we talk about an optimal choice, and then we talk about 
And go back and think about the growth models of the first part of the semester. Same thing. We had a saddle path taking us to the new e to the to the equilibrium. That's a really interesting feature of these models. Okay. And Blanchard and Kahn in the in the discrete time analog said that this is a restriction on the matrix that expresses the the current vector of uh, of variables as a function of the lagged vector of variables. This, this I think we called it an A matrix. Um, it has to have the number, it's a square matrix, it has the number of eigenvalues uh, that are inside the unit circle has to equal the number of predetermined or state variables. Okay, and it has to be exactly, you can't have more or less. Actually, if the number of eigenvalues is, is less, then the model is, is just unstable. Okay, so it won't, have a, it won't have any stability properties at all. The interesting thing is, what if you actually had too many roots of that, uh, you know, I, number of eigenvalues were too, were larger than the number of state variables? There's no reason to rule that out, unless the model tells you that's the case. Okay, you have to actually compute the, the eigenvalues. And it turns out that there are an interesting class, there is an interesting class of models with rational expectations, so it's not, it's not complete deviant behavior. It's actually rational expectations in which the number of eigenvalues inside the unit circles is greater than the number of predetermined variables in the system. Okay? And the model is therefore globally stable, but the number of paths to the steady state is not unique. It's not equal to one. Okay? So that's, that's, that, that little bit of information you know, that bit of sort of looseness in the canon, as it were, allows you to, you, 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 th you say, well, I don't know where the economy, I don't have enough information to tell you where the economy has, has to be right now. In, in the previous models we've looked at, um, especially the RBC model we looked at in detail, there is a unique value of consumption that brings us back to the steady state in the absence of future shocks. Okay, and we call that the saddle stable solution. Well, in this, in this situation, you actually don't have a unique path. You can just pick any value of consumption and you'll get to the steady state. Okay, so that's kind of a, so how do I fix the path? Because we, see, we don't see the economy, we see the economy on a path and the selection mechanism is an open, it's, an, it's like a free, a free, uh, a free um, variable, a degree of freedom that you can choose. And the sunspot idea is to use the sunspot as a way of fixing that equilibrium. So the sunspot would basically say, okay, uh, people are in a lousy mood because the sun, yeah, I can't sleep and my, the sunspots are bothering me and I'm in a bed, I'm just nasty, blah, blah, blah. And that causes the economy to select a different path. That's one idea. The other idea would be that businessmen are optimistic because Trump got elected president, so they all just choose a higher rate of investment and that leads to a boom. Okay, But you need the property that the number of Eigenvalues in that matrix, a very important matrix, is, is basically um, less than the number of state variables, greater than the number of state variables in the economy. Okay? So what kind of models would do that? It turns out that models with increasing returns will do that. Remember, all the models we've had in production, uh, we've assumed a, a, a production function with constant returns of scale in capital and labor. Okay? Or in the New Keynesian world, you have unit, you have a... a constant returns of scale on labor, uh, that kind of does the trick. But what happens if you actually thought that bigger economies had higher average productivity? Suppose that getting larger meant, uh, at least locally, you'd have some sort of increasing returns to scale. That's a, certainly a possibility, okay? Um, there are possible indeterminacies that we don't want to talk about, which is you might have several steady states. We'll just talk about the path, okay? So a certain class of models have um, that have increasing returns to scale in production actually have sunspot spot models. So you need this extra shock or you know, this extra selection mechanism uh, to choose the equilibrium path. So this would give us the exact what we want. We have to decide now how does the economy organize its uh, expectations to, to choose one equilibrium path over the other. And that's a matter for discussion, but one might be looking at psychology, for example, looking at market sentiment. You can, nowadays we can use the internet to sample sentiment and find out what people are, you know, what, what, what they're chattering about um, to the extent that that reflects their true opinions. Okay? And in these models, um, we can't um, abdicate our responsibility for policy because you can actually be on a bad equilibrium and the government could actually do something about it. 
So for those of you, you know, kind of miss the policy, um, if, you, if you're a, of, a, of, of this particular, you know, conviction that, that there are multiple equilibrium paths and indeed government uh, action uh, could coordinate the economy on a better path. Okay, so it's an interesting, interesting dimension. And again, you can think about technology and sunspots as being kind of observationally equivalent. It's very difficult to convince a, there are, there's a whole group of people that really believe in the sunspot approach to macro. Um, we call this indeterminacy. Um, and if you know, it's really hard to it's hard to develop a test um, because the models are kind of observationally equivalent. So you run into this sort of sort of dead end where you're you're not really. Um, it's very difficult to convince the other side. So you really have to, to be clever, and new research in this area is really needed, right? To make the case that indeed these, these extraneous sources, they don't have to be sunspots, they can be anything that just puts us on a different path, are important. And it's se severely difficult. Okay, so again, I give you, a, a, in, in previous courses, 10 years ago, I actually solved one of these models. I mean, just, I don't believe in torturing students anymore. <laughs> I used to, but you know, this is a great example. You could do it on your own. Just go home and take this model, the, the RBC model we've played with until now, and put in uh, this type of increasing returns. You might want to make it like Romer increasing returns where people um, either don't understand that there's increasing returns, but in the equilibrium there are, because they, they think they're all constant returns at the micro level, or you could actually treat them like a monopolist. Okay, you could do that. Um, and these models, uh, lead to this indeterminate result, which you can you can you can either believe or not, but it's something that the, the economics definitely holds in the background. And there are other ways to get increasing uh, to, to get indeterminacy. You can derive even indeterminacy also in uh, in New Keynesian models. Okay, with certain types of Taylor rules, you can actually get the Taylor rule is not aggressive enough. If central bankers are kind of kind of wimpy and they don't go after inflation too fast, and they can actually lead to to um, multiple equilibria path as well. Okay. So here's the famous table that I wanted to show you. You can basically use this as to, to kind of uh, classify the models we've looked at un until now. The only one we haven't looked at until now is the Lucas model, which you don't have to worry about, but it's a fascinating model which derives um, an upward sloping supply curve only on the basis of people's misperceived uh, information about the price level. So L Lucas wrote this paper in the 1970s, and one of the things he got the Nobel Prize for said that um, basically you have, an, you have a, an expectation of the price level and you, you can't sample the price level while you're working. So in a sense, you form this expectation before you go to work, before you set your wages, and then you get surprised. Okay, and the surprise might be right, wrong, but that surprise uh, and your ability to react to it is kind of the, the same thing that, that Mankiw uh, and Reese and uh, Ben Essie talk about in their uh, information rigidities. The Lucas rigidity is simply one period before. Okay, you update your, your forecast. So that's, a, that's a, a, a model where you have monetary neutrality only in the expectation. Actually, when the money hits, the, the economy moves away from its, uh, from its long run uh, equilibrium. Okay, so you might want to stare at this for a while. This is kind of interesting. Okay, so now let me finish the, the course basically by putting this all together in a single setup. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, try to appeal to those of you who come from a different tradition. Uh, you might have taken macro in the U.S. or in, in the U.K. Uh, you might have taken it with me or with uh, Professor Weinke. Um, and some of you might have seen the ISLM model. A lot of people call it the ISTR model. That's what I do. And some people don't even teach it anymore. So again, we have to bring everyone together because these things are still there. We still have uh, something like a TR curve. It's the monetary policy. Everybody believes the monetary policy, uh, that monetary policy exists and can be somehow <laughs> captured in a, in a formal way. We also believe that there is a, a money market. Maybe we don't care about it, so we've got that. And then we've got this, this fixed prices was kind of a, was a, was a fairy tale to get us into the, into the idea of, of Keynesian economics, but um, most of us are ready to move on, okay, because we like this stuff. Um, the polar opposite was the classical model where prices are perfectly flexible. Um, so I hope you watch the movie because you're, you've missed some really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's the last time you will be greeted like this, probably in the rest of your academic career, but I, uh, I love it. I love it. I've been doing this for 25 years. I love it. Um, so the opposite would be the classical model where monetary neutrality uh, reigns over everywhere and always, and you have a dichotomy. So the, the monetary stuff can you put in a corner, and the real stuff you can look at on its own. And we, we learned, um, at, hopefully, by the end of this semester, that the interaction of these real and nominal rigidities is important to get the Keynesian effect. The Keynesian effect says demand actually affects output independently of the constellation of supply. Now, there's going to be some a surge of government spending, like Trump starts spend, spend spending on military. That's going to have an effect on the U.S. economy. After 9-11, uh, in the United States, they spent a lot of money on security. There was a small increase, in, a measurable increase in output. And I think most of us would, would attribute that to the increase in, in security spending. Similarly, uh, you know, at the end of the Cold War, military spending was, 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 was reduced in the United States under, under um, Clinton. And that had a depressing effect, at least locally, in, in some American regions in the U.S., you can say the same thing about Germany and unification. There's a huge surge of spending in East Germany, uh, massive effects on output in West Germany. There's no way you can say that's all supply. It's just, it's just nonsense, okay? So, you know, a good economist says demand and supply, they're, they're in there. So that's why we have ASAD, and I gave you the toy model to play with. It's kind of almost a caricature of these ideas. So you don't, you don't want to take that and show your... Your, your professor, this model, you want to show them that you've learned all the other stuff, but this is a way of classifying the stuff in your head and being able to, to address, I mean, I teach this to MBAs. I teach the, the ASA to MBAs because it's kind of a nice way to sort things out, right? And I hope you remember that. So now I'm going to try to motivate it because we attacked, we attacked that toy model. We said it was ridiculous. We said it, was, it ignored uh, any sort of first principles about budgets, and uh, it also ignored... Uh, micro foundations, and I'm try, trying to convince you today that it wasn't a waste of time. We're going to try to show how you can bring it, bring it all back together again, okay? All right, so again, you have the same, the same thing I just said. You have uh, price rigidity, which makes the nominal price level a state variable, okay? So that's a really important fact. The, the price level doesn't jump anymore like it did in the Kagan model. The price level is a jumping variable. Now it's a it's it's got this it's nailed to the past in some way. Okay, just like the capital stock is nailed to the past, and just like consumption is not nailed to the past. Consumption is a jumping variable. Right, that's what the modern macro uh, you know mantra is. That basically, you have to classify variables in your model, whether they're state variables or co-state slash jumping variables. So we already have a great set of ingredients. We're there. All we have to do is put them together. We've got the IS curve. Uh, you may have heard about it in a different way. We already know that there's an intertemporal Euler equation that governs spending today versus spending tomorrow. That's a key part of our logic. And the, the link between spending today and spending tomorrow is the interest rate, and it's the real interest rate, the rate you really have to pay. So we have to adjust the interest rate nominal for the inflation rate. So you can see already we have an interaction of nominal and real forces in this economy. Okay. The interest rate is coming from a central bank authority. So we still have central banks, and they lend to banks, and banks lend to us, create the money supply. We use it. Uh, so all these ingredients are already there on the table. We just looked at them. Okay. So look at that equation. <laughs> so if you understood the IS curve, intertemporal investment savings, spending savings uh, trade-off, add to the, ta to the Taylor rule to that, and you already have an AD curve, which expresses aggregate demand in relation to the inflation rate. Why? If output rises, the central bank raises interest rates, holding everything else constant, that means demand goes down. Okay, so it's, that's, the, that's the cheap way of getting to where we were before. And again, if you really like this stuff, you can spend hours and days and weeks deriving more fancy versions of this. Okay? And on the supply side, the AS curve is simply the augmented. I say augmented because it's, it's now beefed up with Calvo and Rodenberg. It's not a you know, mindless Phillips curve anymore. It's a new Keynesian Phillips curve. 
So it's based on uh, some view of what the firms are doing. Firms set prices. They set prices in the nominal unit, and they set, set them under conditions of, of imperfect information or some uh, limitation on their freedom to set prices. So we can actually use the equations that we have and just start playing with them. Okay, the first equation in this picture, in this slide, is kind of a, an expression of the IS idea. Uh, if you move the expectation of output tomorrow to the left-hand side, it looks like the rate of change in output going forward, expected rate of change of output, is a function of the real interest rate on the right-hand side. Okay, and this is all in logs, okay, so we can think of, think of B1 as an elasticity of aggregate demand with respect to the real interest rate, and the expectation at period T of, of delta PT plus 1 is just the inflation rate going forward. So B, PT plus 1 minus PT um, would be, the, would be the, the term we're looking at, and then little v is like a shock, any old demand shock given um, expectations, which is also another locator for the demand for the uh, IS curve or for the AD curve um, and um, the um, what is IT? IT is the policy interest rate so that is already a, a, a set by the central bank so the central bank's behavior will be embedded into the first curve to get the AD curve like I said IS plus TR is equal to AD and we see that the central bank is looking at inflation expected inflation. It's also looking at expected inflation as a deviation from its policy target, which is pi. Okay, so that's something you have to remember. And then you've got the, the leaning against the wind would be D2 positive. So when little yt is greater than zero, because this is in logs, then you're going to expect the interest rate to be raised by the central bank, independent of the inflation rate, because it's trying to lean against the wind. So D1 and D2 are both positive. D1 Positive means the, infl infl the, the, the central bank cares about getting too far away from its target, and it does so in a linear way. So that's, that's an implementation of the same curve we had before. Again, I changed the notation, but you'll see why in a second. And the last one is the, is the New Keynesian Phillips curve, which you've de derived. And now look what I've done. I've cheated all over the place. I've got, a, I've got indexation. So 1 minus C1 is the indexation term. Remember I told you the New Keynesian, the, 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 the weak undergirding uh, or the, the weak, um, what, would the, what would the German expression be? Sort of like the, the Schwachstelle of the, of the New Keynesian Phillips curve is exactly this backward persistence. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going to put in some backward persistence in there. Okay, so 1 minus C1, C1 is, uh, lives in the interval between 0 and 1, is kind of the weight on the backward part, and then C1 would be the weight on the forward part. So I'm free to choose the weighting. So I, I go for the pure Phil Keynesian Phillips curve, then I choose C1 is equal to 1, okay, uh, or close to 1. And I have, this, this model has neutrality because if you think about it, if inflation rises um, uh, forever, nothing changes. That's an important feature that I think is important. Okay, this, this model actually has monetary neutrality built into it. Okay, the policy rules don't affect the uh, behavior of output in the long run. So here, here, this is a shock. So if, if, um, if the OPEC um, countries raise in, uh, oil prices tomorrow, that shows up today uh, with, with you. Okay, so we have these three shocks. Okay, remember, think about Slutsky, uh, my, my good Russian friend Slutsky. Um, the shocks, the system translates into observable output, output outcomes. Okay, and we have, we have rational expectations as, as just to make things really exciting. Uh, that means that we have the law of iterated expectations, which I already referred to, which says that the expectation uh, conditional on T, information of an expectation conditional on in the subsequent period uh, of a future variable is equal to the expectation conditioned on the smaller information set. Okay, so now how would I solve this thing? This thing looks like, uh, like, like a monster. How would I solve it? So this is something you should just kind of regurgitate, and especially in, a, in a, an emergency situation. How do you solve linear models like this? Method of undetermined coefficients. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's easy. Okay, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this. I'm just trying to give you an idea that these, this is a complicated model, even though it's only got three equations, it's got three shocks. It's got everything we care about in macro, but it's complicated because it has these expectations of the future. 
Okay, and, and I'm telling you the rational expectation. So the, the agents, in a sense, possess the model, and they're actually expecting inflation. The central bank is expecting inflation based on the correct model. Okay, so I'm taking this really seriously. And this is kind of the way we do this. We, this is a discipline, because I can just assume anything for expectations. People are idiots, they do stupid stuff, and then I can get any result I want. But I'm imposing the model's logic, internal logic, on the, on the behavior of the agents. And you see, inflate, and expectations appears in a lot of places. It appears here. So this, this is potential, the expectation of future output by our, by our uh, households and firms. This is the expectation of future inflation by our household and firms which is the same expectation inflation uh, that, uh, that's formed by our central bank. And it's also the same inflation expectation that's formed by our workers and firms as they set their prices. Okay? And because everyone's just as smart as the other, um, we can use the method of undetermined coefficients um, imposing that on the entire solution. Okay, so I will just insert the Taylor rule into the IS equation to get an AD equation. And that's the first result. So this is the AD equation. Look at that. It's got tomorrow's output. It's got expectations of inflation. And it's got these two shocks. So that's nice. That's going to help us. Um, and then I've got the Keynesian Phillips curve, um, which already is already in nice form. And I can just write it using matrix notation like this. So here's my, this is the vector of variables I care about. This is the vector of variables I care about one period in the past. And then I've just, I've just taken these coefficients and put them into the, into the respective matrices to make it work, to make it a linear system. And then I can rearrange it, you know, invert, uh, invert this matrix to get yt and delta pt as a function of those objects on the right-hand side. And what are those objects? One period lagged, okay? So gamma one looks like our A matrix before, and this is expectations of the future. Okay, and then you've got the shocks. So this is, this is capturing everything we've learned in macro. We've got the current shocks that we can actually feel today, and then we've got expectations of the future, given everything else, and then we've got the past. Okay, so we, we can basically, um, we can, after rearranging this, we can actually use the method of undetermined coefficients to solve, because to solve this model, we need to find out what gamma and uh, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 actually are, because they're going to depend on the deep parameters that we had before. They're going to depend on uh, A1, C2, C1, B1, etc. Okay? So I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that the solution takes that form. I'm just going to say I, I, I'm convinced, and you know maybe I'm wrong, uh, but to the extent that it's a linear model, one solution that we care about will look like this. It will have this form B, C, and D multiplying these respective uh, vectors, and I just need to find out what those Bs, what the B and C and D are. B is a 2 by 2, by two C is a uh, 2 by 2, and D is a um, 2 by 3. Okay, and that's summarizing everything. Okay, so if, if, that, if that indeed is the fact, if that's the model solution, then agents know that it's the model solution, so when they form their expectations, they will basically take an expectation of that unknown coefficient form. Okay, so in the future, the agents don't know what ut, vt, and wt are, so the expectation, the rational expectation of that vector one period ahead is simply a uh, B times the yt delta pt vector plus ct times the past, okay? And therefore, we can actually take that and plug it into the expectations term, okay? So that's the third step. And you can see that now I've got yt and delta pt on the left as a function of stuff on the right that has nothing to do with expectations because the expectations are generated by the past according to the model's equilibrium. And then I can solve for that, Gesundheit, and I can solve for that, and I can get exactly um, the form the model was assumed to be in the first place. So the last equation on that slide is exactly the form B plus C plus D times the respective vectors. Okay? So I just have to match the coefficients. I have to match that with 
B, and I have to match that with C, and D, well, what happened to D? Well, D's also there. C is equal to zero, okay? Because you can see basically the, 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 the lag doesn't matter. And the way I've set this up, and you can set this up in different ways, and you get different, if you, depending on the lag structure, you can get different solutions. But the point is, it's a demo, I'm trying to demonstrate how you use the method of undetermined coefficients. Kind of angst, it won't show up on the, on the exam. Uh, it'd be crazy for me to ask you to do this. I just want to show you, you can actually have a computer do this for you. Okay, you can actually, um, and I, I want you to understand the logic of undetermined coefficients. I've got, I know that B has to have this form, and I know that C has to be zero, and I know that D has to have the form that's up there. Okay, so if I, if I took B and, and, and wrote it out as B11, B12, B21, B22, I could match term for term what I know it to be on the left. So you can see it's kind of a recursive thing. B1 on the left, B1 on the right, uh, B12 on the left, B12 on the right. So it, I'm going to have to solve this system. I could do this by rote hand, by algebra. I got four unknowns um, and four equations. Because each, I'm matching each one of those, those terms one, one for one. So I've got four terms, four equations, four unknowns. You can do that. <laughs> it's kind of painful. And you usually get something like a quadratic or a cubic. And I've, I've, I've done this in a neat, neat way because it's actually not that way. But in general, it would be kind of hairy. But we can use numerical methods to solve for B. We can actually use a computer. This is why you guys have an advantage. You can use a numerical approach. Because B on the left, B on the right, they have to match. Okay? So these Bs have to be the same. Now, you can't, you can't this is a matrix equation. It's an equation of a matrix. You can't solve for B like, like you do in algebra because it's, it's like it's trapped in a, in a Russian doll. You have to get in there. How are you going to get in there? Okay, well, the, the trick to get in there is to use numerical methods. The, a choice of B here implies a new B on the left-hand side. And when those two are equal, I've reached kind of a fixed point. And that's the B. That's the B I want. Okay? So this turns out to be really trivial. Okay? And you can do this on, on your own with an Excel spreadsheet or a MATLAB program. You just have to rewrite this guy in this form. So here, here you have this. This is my sort of implied B from this choice of B. And B squared is simply the square of a matrix. Okay, so you just square it. So I can take, I can start with some random, um, I, should start, I should start with this starting value. So I start with zeros and plug it in, get a, a B first guess. Okay, it won't be equal to, to 0, 0, 0, 0 for sure, but I can use that new implied value as a new seed value for the next round and iterate, iterate, iterate. And at some point, these two matrices get really close to each other. They're not changing much anymore, and that means you've, you've, you've hit the jackpot. You've actually got the solution you're looking for. And I've done this on a, I've done this, uh, you can code this up in a second. It's really easy. Okay, and, and if you have a big, big system with many equations, it's not so easy, but um, it's all doable. Okay, and it turns out there's a cool, cool condition uh, which says that this convergence will actually happen as long as the, the eigenvalues of this B matrix, which we don't really uh, know a whole lot about yet, um, if you know that it has um, eigenvalues that are all less than one in modulus, that means that the thing kind of it defines kind of a contraction map mapping. The new thing will always be closer. It won't explode, put it differently. It gets closer and closer to what you're looking for. And that's this convergence condition here. This thing is like a, a norm, a distance measure between matrices, okay, comparing um, individual values and which one is the biggest. Okay, and that guy has to get small and small as well. Okay, so this is, this is how we actually do it in a lot of practical applications. You won't do this if you go to a central bank. There'll be programs that do this for you. But in the ultimate, this is kind of what numerical solution um, of potentially much larger systems. OK, so you could play with a baby two, two by two. Um, you could get much more complicated. OK, so I'm done with this. So I'm going to finish. I'm going to spend the last 15 minutes just talking about macro. Okay, and maybe inspiring you to go on and go to some other university. <laughs>
or maybe stay here, or stay in Berlin. Berlin's a cool place. Okay, so macro is about measurement. This is the way I, te I teach macro one. Measurement and analysis. Think of a doctor. Dr. Anameza, take the symptoms, get them right. Oh, you're late. Man, you missed it. Watch the movie. It's okay. I'm not going to... I'm going to praise you for that, okay? Uh, but watch the movie. So measurement, it's like the doctor looking at the patient and seeing right, he's missing an arm or got a scar or something, hurt, foot hurts or he's got a rash, and then what do I, what do, I do with, the, with this information? So these are both important. I think a lot of economists um, undervalue the first part. It's kind of nice to know what the inflation rate is. And it's also nice to know what the GDP of Germany is. It's also nice to know what the definition of GDP is. And a lot of, a lot of students uh, forget that quickly. Um, but then you've got to do some diagnosis. So um, the diagnosis part is, is, the, is, the, is the craft. It's like the, you, you know, it's, it's a science and it's also an art. And, and the art is developing the right um, set of ideas to, 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 to go forward. And this is not trivial at all. It's also true of micro. So in physics and chemistry, have, you're much further along, uh, but they're, not also not, they're also not clean. I mean, I, when I learned chemistry as a student, we had this model of the way atoms looked, like the planetary system, right? I mean, you, this, this nucleus, and you have a, these electrons spinning around uh, ro ro you know, very fast. We also know it's kind of hard to track them. It's really hard to track them. And now we think of them as clouds or just probability distributions. So it, these are models. It's a little bit like, like what we do. It's not really that different. Uh, but they're much farther along uh, the road to science than, than we are. And we can't experiment with people. We can't experiment with, with human beings, although we can watch uh, in real time things that look like experiments um, in the data. And yet people ask us for advice and they want to know what they should do and you know, whether we should get rid of the hearts reforms now or whether we should, uh, we should Germany just start spending a lot of money on uh, the nord süd -Trasse. These are things that you can actually take a stand on now. And if you take more courses, you'll take even more stands. So think of Mankiw, uh, my uh, hero, Greg Mankiw, who um, wrote this fantastic article, which I'll post. He talks about macroeconomists as scientists and engineers. Okay, so there's the science part, basic research, how does the world work, uh, how can I make the Calvo model better, and then um, the other thing is I've I got I to gotta generate a solution because people are calling me now, and if I don't give them something, they're going to think we're, we're just wasting our time. So that's the tension. The tension is offering a serious answer to questions um, for which there's a pressing need and desire uh, to address Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we're going. Um, so what have we done in this course? We've, we've done a lot. I think we've done a whole lot. I mean, I mean you'll, you'll see when you start studying your exam that we've done quite a bit. And uh, this last lecture is kind of decelerating, you know, kind of like after the roller coaster. Now we slow down, you're about to get out and hopefully get out. Uh, and I'd like to just kind of, um, you know, again, I've tried to help you with this, this two by two table. Um, think that, take that. Seriously, because again, uh, we the models we've talked about um, can all kind of be put in this class in this set. Uh, we're talking about two features. One is market clearing, okay, and the other is monetary neutrality. So market clearing would mean that in the model in the at the bottom of the model, there's this possibility that that uh, firms uh, are producing more than they would like to if they were able to choose things freely. Um, or workers are working for wages that are lower than they would if they were able to choose freely or able to recontract for some reason. So we have a lot of open questions, and if we're honest, we, we should think about those. Um, are technology important? Shock's important. Um, <laughs> here's the paradox. In the first part of the course, I teach you that technology, um, what we make with given capital and labor, is actually the secret to our well-being. If you look at the TFP of Germany, compare it with the TFP of Niger, it's enormously different. So that means that if, even if you could move all the equipment and people to, that, that are in this country to Niger, you would not be able to achieve the GDP per capita that, that Germany has. So this TFP, this 
um, we call it technology, um, total factor productivity uh, is important. In the long run, it, it has to be important. So the question is how important it is in the short run. And this is where Keynesian and or new Keynesian and, and classical economists diverge on their opinion. Uh, the new Keynesian uh, model actually predicts that a technology shock causes a recession. Okay, because it actually it it causes uh, firms to release labor at, at, at rigid prices, and it causes um, an increase in unemployment, which causes workers to consume less, um, and in firms possibly to to invest less as well. Um, this is a, this is kind of in contradiction to what we think technology shocks do in the long run. So this is kind of a tension. The data seems to su support the new Keynesian approach. So if you do a, a restricted vector autoregression, it's kind of hard to avoid um, this interpretation of shocks to output given out, uh, labor and given uh, tech, uh, capital. Okay, um, so this is one interesting open question: is how to how to square that? Maybe maybe over the ensuing recovery, the the uh, the technology um, effect on the economy, the economy in the long run gets reestablished. We also need to think about how price rigidity actually happens and the role of aggregate demand. Um, one in, very important question that we still have to, to deal with, that you deal with in a more advanced course at, at this university or elsewhere, would be the role of, of the banking sector. We've kind of block, blocked out the banking sector because uh, in the past recessions, uh, up until the most recent one, the banking sector has had a very subsidiary role um, in accounting for what happened. But the last recession, the Great Recession, is clearly an exception. So a lot of research nowadays is looking at how to bring credit and intermediation, what banks do, back into the system. Also trying to account for the zero lower bound, the idea that interest rates are so low now that uh, monetary policy cannot, cannot follow the Taylor principle anymore. They can't uh, if the recession were to come uh, next year in Europe, we'd, the ECB would have problems cutting interest rates because it can't. Okay, uh, this is a question that, that dogs the IMF right now, and uh, there's been a response by German policymakers because they think this is um, a serious, a serious issue. Uh, maybe we should have raised interest rates uh, in the last mini recovery to to get ready for the next recession. Um, I already mentioned the sunspots. And of course, we haven't talked about unemployment. This is a plug for my course. You know, if you want to take, if you want to learn more about unemployment, you should take more courses in macro. And I give a course in thinking about unemployment seriously. Um, it's the role of, um, and I'll tell you why. The, the, the reason why is because the standard model in this area considers labor supply to equal labor demand almost everywhere. So you ac actually have this, com this, this weird, uh, notion that recessions are associated with voluntarily withholding labor supply, possibly uh, for very small wage changes, but in any case, an equilibrium view, a martial view of labor supply is kind of inconsistent with what we think of when we think of unemployment. Again, talk to people who are in the heart system, they have a very strong view about this. So maybe the idea is to think about other reasons that unemployment can emerge, namely information uh, skill asymmetries, a misallocation of, of, um, of, of skills across different skill sets, um, search frictions, matching frictions, and the rest. Okay, so these are all things that are important to macroeconomists uh, going forward. Now, so if you think about it, our field has, in, has evolved um, over a long time. Keynes was literally the father of macroeconomics. There was no serious, um, the word didn't even exist before. Uh, and Keynes didn't even coin the word macroeconomics, but it sort of gave rise to the field. Um, before that, we had this view that Walrasian market clearing was the way to think about things. Um, Keynes came along and made us think about demand, but then we maybe got too fixated on demand and didn't think about money. And the 1970s proved to us that money was important in the sense that um, after the collapse of Bretton Woods, money could do whatever it wanted. Fiat money was everywhere, and we had inflation. And um, it took people like Lucas and Sargent and Robert Barrow to, to make us think about expectations um, and people anticipating uh, the emergence of, of um, or the develop the evolution of the money supply as a, and monetary value, variables in general. Um, 
the Reformation, every revolution has a Reformation, you know, it's like religion. <laughs> uh, so the, the Rational Expectations Revolution was followed by a new Keynesian Reformation. So now we have Catholics and Protestants in our field. And um, the, the, the Catholics, I guess, are the Mankiw, Galli, Woodford, um, those guys. Um, and we need to think hard about the next generation. So a lot of people actually have gotten their PhDs in this department have thought about uh, intermediation. So hedge funds, for example, substitutes for banks. Hedge funds move lots of resources in the same way that banks do, but they're not regulated and they don't produce means of payment. Okay, so this is really exciting. Uh, you can also think about um, banking in general. Is, is the banking model any good? I mean, this is, uh, in, Ger in Germany, this is a big issue because of low interest rates, but also banks that have based their business model on, on markups, on loans. Um, Germans don't like to borrow too much. This is a problem, right? And if they can't earn money on deposits, uh, putting them in the money market because interest rates are so low, uh, this is a problem for the Deutsche Bank. It's a problem for the Commerzbank. It's a problem for the Sparkasse. And this is why everyone's complaining about low interest rates. So this is why macro is so exciting, right? It's really exciting. So you should all be really excited. But um, we're always fighting the battles of the last war. So we're focusing on stuff that caused the Great Recession, but actually what's going to cause the next crash? Is it going to be trade? Is it going to be Trump? Is it going to be uh, another conflict? Who knows? I'd just like to give my opinion on this because uh, journalists call me all the time and ask me, you know, you guys never talk about the financial crisis. So ever since they, they did this to me, I always had this slide in my, my lecture. I have to talk about the financial crisis for five seconds because we did not cause the financial crisis. Macroeconomists did not cause it. And... Um, uh, there were a lot of economists who actually did speak up, but they were kind of ignored because I do think there, there's a lot of inertia and there's a lot of conventional thinking that sort of crowded out the voices that said, you know, there's a lot, there's a, John Taylor said the interest rates in the United States in, in, the, in, the, in the years leading up to the financial crisis were too low according to his rule. So John Taylor was one of the big, but he, you know, he's kind of conservative guy, so he didn't get a lot of airtime on Fox News for saying that, okay? So, um, but there were people who actually on the Clinton side who also kind of got, got squelched, okay? So I'm gonna mention some people. Um, this guy, Raghuram Rajan, is a really impressive guy who's a, he actually became governor of the Central Bank of Italy, of India for a while, and he was a professor at Chicago, went back to Chicago. This guy basically said in the, in the mid-2000s there was too much leverage, too many derivatives out there, uh, and if with counterparty risk this could have a big problem. Nouriel Roubini, Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize laureate, all these guys were, but they're kind of treated like Cassandras because the financial sector was making money hands over foot. So hand over foot, Making money is a great way to suppress anybody who wants to say something. So these guys were kind of ignored. So it's unfair to say that we didn't understand that there were some problems. But of course, hurting behavior um, may have caused us to to not say enough. Okay, so let's finish uh, the course. Let's finish everything by asking again. These, these slides that I presented at the beginning of the course, you should remember them. Okay. Why do we do this? Um, we want to understand the facts. We want to do the, the, the symptoms. And then we also want to understand how to think about the symptoms in a consistent way that can be applied to new situations that we've never seen before. Okay, so that's really kind of what a, that's, think, of that this, think about the theory of special relativity. All the situations, you, all the things you can cook up in your mind thinking about um, what happens when things get close to the speed of light relative to, it's just amazing. So that, and, and it seems to be like these things are right. So the theory of special relativity has done pretty well, and that's kind of what we would hope for our theories as well, okay? New, new, confronting with new uh, situations and being able to get through the door somehow. Okay, so the, a model, again, I showed this again, you should remember a model is a way of organizing our thoughts. It's true in the natural sciences is also true um, in, our, uh, in our field. It's a way of presenting a theory in a compact way. Okay, so compact. You want to write down everything 
And this is why some people are moving towards models with many agents in the economy. You really should convince people that the multiplicity of agents um, is going to help you understand the regularities you see. So distribution, for example, if you have two different classes of people, rich and poor, uh, they behave differently. Maybe that affects macroeconomics. So there is a good reason to think about um, heterogeneous agents, but you better have a good explanation of why agents can't become, uh, that are poor can't become rich, or can't, rich agents that can't become poor, because that's also part of the world we observe. And that, you, you don't want to have a, you know, a two-class two system without a good way of, of allowing agents to, to move, because that may affect the equilibrium of the economy. Now, I mention that because an, a representative agent is an abstraction. It's supposed to capture you know, certain regularities in behavior that are essential for understanding macro, intertemporal substitution, price setting, et cetera. We don't really believe there's a single firm out there or a single household, but we can surely make some progress on the, on the general tendency of the model by looking at these agents. Okay, so again, quoting Robert King, why do we do a theory? A theory is to help us think about causes and the consequences that result. And this is a way of helping us understand the world because we're confronted with new situations and we need to have a theory of causality. Okay, so theories are ultimately about causality, not description, but because of causality. And the reason why we use math is because it helps us cut away our own emotions and, and uh, Sort of eruptions, getting upset about things and getting into fights. You know, if you use math, you can actually, and you don't use math because you want to show off. That was Romer's critique. You want to use math because it helps you convince other people that if you assume A, B, and C, then D follows and not E. Okay? So, um, Cain said this. Remember? So it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a method. It's not a doctrine. So keep that in mind when you go forward. So who's that guy? <laughs> looks like a typical economist. Anybody? Okay. He's really one of the big guys of the, of the 20th century. So Alfred Marshall, right? Supply and demand. Okay, so what did he tell? He told his student, Pigou, who was kind of probably troubled, had one of his little crises, emotional you know, breakdowns or whatever. He said, basically, use mathematics as a shorthand, not as an engine of inquiry. So that's interesting. So you have to have the idea in your head before you start writing down the model. I think that's very, very